Okay, so we can do our discussion about uh, derivatives. So specifically last time we left off with the following uh, comment, which was average rates of change. So I'll just I'll make it singular. Average rate of change. Okay, that is this. If I draw an axis and I make a nice looking function on it. And I always do that, don't I? And then I select two points. And if this is maybe, you know, we'll call this axis uh, P for position, and we'll call this axis T for time, just so that we can connect this to something physically relevant. Then if this is, the first point happens at time A, and the second point happens at time uh, B, and if we call this height here P of A, and so then if I call that one P of A, then what's this one? P of B, right? So then in between those two points, in between those two points, I can draw a secant line. Okay, so then I'll do that. Okay, so then the slope of the secant line uh, has a familiar formula, should be familiar to you by now. The slope of the secant line is <coughs> slope of secant line is m is equal to, in terms of uh, p and a and b, what is it? Yeah, p of b minus p of a, p of a, and then what? Over b minus a, right? The rise over the run. So then, if we take the usual, if we take the usual um, naming conventions, then we could label this horizontal distance what? What is the usual name for it? Okay, so the one I'm looking for is delta x. So that's the one I'm looking for. So then if that's the usual name I was looking for for the horizontal distance, what's the usual name for the vertical distance? Delta y, good. Okay, so then I could rewrite this formula over here that m is delta y over delta x. Okay, now if this represents position in time and a and b are two different instants in time, then then the slope of the secant line represents the average rate of change of position over that interval, right? The average rate of change. So then an example would be if we travel 100 miles and we do so in two hours, then on average we were traveling 50 miles an hour. It may so happen that we probably weren't actually tra traveling 50 miles an hour for, for many instances. You know, maybe, maybe for the first half of the trip we could only go uh, 30 miles an hour because we were in town and the last half of the trip we were traveling 90 miles an hour on the highway because we were trying to make up time. Okay, but on average 50 miles an hour. Okay, so this is called the, this is uh, physically called the average rate of change. So then this slope is the average rate of change. Okay, and that's important for you to know because what happens, what will happen is that in some context I'll say compute the average rate of change. And then you'll say, oh, I can't remember how to compute the average rate of change. If only he asked me to compute the slope of the secant line. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so we don't want that to happen. You know, another thing that happens is I'll say compute the slope of the secant line and then you know, student solves, solves it correctly. And then I say, now part B, what is the average rate of change? 
and then you say, darn, <laughs> you leave that one blank because you don't know that one. So all I want you to do is write the answer from the previous part on the next part. So does everybody sort of see, see this? Okay, so then now, if, if I hold the point in time t, t is A fixed, and then I move the point in time B toward A in limit, then until these two points in time actually coincide, okay, so then the result will no longer be a secant line, it will be a, a tangent line, a tangent line. And so then when you have, you know, it makes sense to say the question, find the average rate of change between time A and time B, but it doesn't make sense to say find the average rate of change at time A. No, that doesn't make any sense, right? The, and so then you can see algebraically why it doesn't make any sense, because it would be, you know, in a sense, I guess one way to try and make sense of it would be to write A and A here, right? So then it would be P of A minus P of A over A minus A. Okay, algebraically that doesn't make any sense. So then now, now I can draw another uh, axis. with more or less the same looking function. Okay, and then at a point, T is A. At a point T is A, I can attach the tangent line. I chose gray. I meant to chose green. That's fine. Okay, the tangent line. <coughs> so the tangent line, the tangent line, the slope of the tangent line is the instant radius change, instantaneous rate of change. Okay, but more specifically, it is m is equal to dy dx which is equal to the limit as delta x goes to zero of delta y over delta x, where delta y and delta x are the things from just above this that's no longer visible on the screen. Okay, so then this slope is called the instantaneous rate of change. instantaneous rate of change. So then another way, another place that this comes up is I could say, okay, I want you to compute the slope of the tangent line for this function at this point. And then you do it. Right? And then I say, now I want you to compute the instantaneous rate of change at the same point. And then you say, oh, I don't know how to do that one. No, they're exactly the same thing. They're synonyms for each other. Right? So then you need to make sure that those things are synonyms in your brain. So any question about this? <coughs> Any question? So then, as for uh, other jargon, what this is also called is this, this term, instantaneous rate of change. So then, in the case of a car, or an apple falling, or whatever, this is called velocity. <coughs> OK. So any question about that? OK, so then that t this first page has been mostly just so you know what I'm talking about when I say average rate of change and instantaneous rate of change. Okay, so then now what we're doing is we're going to continue with our discussion about how the derivative interacts with the various arithmetic operations. So then this is section 2.3, which is product and quotient rules. So the product rule, the quotient rule, and higher derivatives. Okay, so then now, just as a, a brief <coughs> review, these are the things that we know. We know that the derivative of a constant is what? Zero. So someone give me a quick geometric reason why this is the case. Constant is a horizontal line. So its tangents are horizontal. 
So the slope of its tangents is zero, so its derivative is zero. Okay. Another thing that we know, another thing that we know is that the derivative of a constant times a function is equal to a constant, that same constant times the derivative of the function. So what that line is saying is that multiplying by the constant or applying the derivative doesn't matter what order you do it in. Right? You can do one first and then the other or the other way around. Okay, so someone give me a quick geometric reason why this is why this seems reasonable. Why does this seem reasonable? Right, so then if you take a line like mx plus b, and then you multiply it by a constant c, then you get cmx plus cb. And what's the slope of the new line? Cm, right, which is exactly c times the slope of the, of the old line. So then this, this seems reasonable. Okay, so then similarly, right, the derivative of f of x plus g of x is the derivative of f of x plus the derivative of g of x, like so. Okay, so those are basically the rules that we know. The other rule that we went over that's important is this one. x to the n is nx to the n minus 1. But it's these first three that I want you to remember for, for now. Okay, so what's this last one called? The power rule. Okay, so any questions about these things? Okay, so now we have some functions here, right? So then I took a function f and multiplied it by a scalar and got another function. That's excellent. Okay, so I took two functions, f and g, and then I added them. Now, when you take two functions and add them, you get another function. All right, so then you can take a constant and a function, compute their product, you get a function. You can take two functions, take their sum or difference, you get another function. So what's something else you can do with functions to combine them to get another function? Divide, but I was looking for a different one first. Multiply, right? You can multiply two functions together and get another function. Okay, so then the question now that we're going to address is this. Okay, so then this is what, what happens when you do this? f of x g of x, right? So what if I take two functions and I multiply them and I want to compute their derivative? How does the derivative interact with that? So, for those of you that haven't taken calculus before, it is probably not what you think. Okay? So then you might think fr from the sum rule, right? From the sum rule, it's really nice. You just take the derivative of each one and then add them together. Uh, for this case, it doesn't work that way. So for this one, for this one, it will be like so. The derivative of f, you'll compute the derivative of f and then multiply it by g, and then add to that f of x multiplied by the derivative of g. Okay, so then now, I'd like to introduce another notation. So what's another, another way to write that we have been writing d dx f of x, f prime? Right, so then f prime of x, g of x, plus f of x, g prime of x. And then another way that this is frequently written is like so. So f of x, g of x, prime. And this is an okay notation for calculus one, but you just need to be very careful because I have seen it many times because I've graded thousands and thousands of questions. A lot of times students aren't really comfortable with the whole concept or they get in a hurry or whatever and they write that prime there and they think it's a one halfway down the page. Okay, I see it. So then, I don't care if you use this notation, just use it carefully. Finally, another notation that is in frequent use is this. Right? So if I, have two, if I have two functions, I'll call them u and v and then compute their derivative, then the compute their product and then derivative u prime v plus u v prime. Okay, so then the virtue of that notation obviously is just that it's a lot shorter to write than the other ones. Okay, so any question about uh, the notation here? Any question? 
okay, so then let's, let's show that this is, uh, in fact, true. Okay, so then we're going to show this. So then I'm going to write, I'm going to write that, uh, let's see, what do I want to call, I don't want to call the function h, because we're going to use h. So how about, uh, what's another name for a function? What is it? T? Uh, I'm afraid of T, because they look like pluses. We'll call it, <laughs> we'll call it S, all right. We'll have S of X is F of X, G of X, yes? Yeah, I'm going to prove it. Yeah, I'm going to prove it to you. Yeah. Yeah, proof, proof is what I mean. <coughs> okay. So then, the derivative of S is the limit as H goes to 0 of S of X plus H minus S of X over H. That's just the definition of the derivative. Yes? You can use delta x all you want, but what you cannot do is you can't write the limit as h goes to 0 and then use delta x in here, or the other way around. <coughs> I, I don't care if you use delta x. I typically don't use delta x because it's more writing, and also it's two symbols. So I prefer just to write one symbol because some students get confused with the fact that there's two symbols. Okay, so then the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h multiplied by g of x plus h minus f of x g of x over h. Okay, so then now, the first line was just the definition of the derivative, the second line was just me replacing what s is. Okay, so then now, we're going to do, I'm going to pull a rabbit out of the hat. Okay, so then, what it is, is I'm going to add 0, right? So then I'm going to add 0 inside of the limit, which is a perfectly legitimate thing to do, except it's going to be a very convenient 0, <laughs> right? So then you've seen in comp computing other limits where we multiplied by 1, and it was a very convenient 1, so now I'm going to add 0. It's going to be a very convenient 0. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h, and g of x plus h. Okay, now here's where I'm going to insert my 0. I'm going to say minus f of x plus h, g of x, and then plus f of x plus h, g of x, and then minus this last term, f of x, g of x. Okay, and all of that all of that over h. So then this term right here, this term right here that I'm boxing, I'm not putting parentheses around it, I'm just indicating it to you. You can see I added something and then I subtracted, the, or no, I subtracted something and then added the same thing, so I didn't change the limit. Okay, but what's important for you to see, uh, algebraically anyhow, is that that particular term has a common factor with the first term, right? What's common? This term right here has what in common with the first term? f of x plus h, right? It has f of x plus h in it. Okay, similarly, the one that I added has a common factor with another term. Which one? g of x. Right? So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that this is f of x plus h, and then g of x plus h minus g of x, like so, and then plus <coughs> uh, f of x plus h minus f of x g of x all over h. Okay, so then that's just me collecting like terms, factoring some things out. So now I can rewrite this, the limit, 
as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h multiplied by g of x plus h minus g of x over h. So what I'm doing is I'm splitting this into the sum of two different things. So plus <coughs> f of x plus h minus f of x over h g of x. Okay. So then, we're very nearly there now. So tell me, this first term in square parentheses with g in it, what is the limit of that? What is the limit of this g of x plus h minus g of x over h? It's the derivative of g. Right, this, this first term in square parentheses, you compute the limit as h goes to 0, that's the derivative of g. Okay, so then that's what goes in there. Okay, now plus. So now the cat is out of the bag, so I should be able to ask this one. This second set of square parentheses, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h as h goes to 0, what is the limit of that? The derivative of f. That's the derivative of f. And then what does g of x do as h goes to 0? It stays g of x, right? It doesn't depend on h. So that's just g of x. Okay, now what does f of x plus h do as h goes to 0? It is f of x. Okay, so then now, of all of these things, I would say the last one that I wrote is the most subtle. Right, because understand, you need to understand a little bit about what it's saying. The limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h is f of x. What does that imply about f of x there? So, so what that's saying is that, is that computing this limit is the same thing as this evaluation. What does that mean about f there? It's continuous there. Right. But it's definitely continuous because we have, the, we have the assumption that it's differentiable, which implies continuity. So of all of these ones that we did, right, this last one, it seems the most innocuous, but I would say it's the most subtle of all of these. Okay, so any question about this? So this is exactly the, the product rule, but it's written in the other order. So now I'll, I'll switch the terms so that it's in the same order that I wrote it in. All I'm doing is rewriting these left and right. Okay, so then this is the reason, the, the computational reason for the product rule. Any question about it? Okay, now, I would say, personally, for my own personal sanity or whatever in preference, that is not a very satisfying thing for me to look at, honestly. Okay, because it's absolutely correct, <laughs> but it doesn't feel like it imparts very much knowledge to me. Okay, so then now I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the geometric reason, right, the geometric reason for why the product rule is what it is. Okay, so now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take let f of x and g of x be given. And I'm also going to have the following requirements that allow me to draw a picture that makes sense. So I'm going to say that f of x is some positive amount, g of x is some positive amount. The derivative of f of x is positive, and the derivative of g of x is positive. Okay, because when you look at it like this, I can relate this to a real-world phenomenon. Okay, I can relate the product rule to a real-world thing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a box. Oh, not that one. How do I make it draw a box? Oh, like this. Oh, okay, I get it. So 
So I draw a box like this and then I'll magically make it a nice looking box. Bam. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, so then if I measure, if I call this one f of x, then I can call this one g of x. Okay, now, the product of f and g are the product of any thing. So if I take, for example, a and b and I compute their product, then what is the geometric interpretation of their product? Something about what I have drawn here, what? Area, right? So then the product of f and g can be geometrically understood to be the area spanned by this rectangle. Right? So this is f of x, g of x is the area of this. f of x, g of x. Okay, so is everybody with me? Okay, so now let's say, let's say that I increase f of x. I increase f of x by just a little bit. So I'll increase it by this much. And so this is, you know, where science is concerned, maybe this is actually a lot, but I just have to draw it this big because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see it. So I'll call this, I'll call this uh, df. Right, that's how much f gets bigger. <coughs> okay. So then now, I'll do the same thing. I'll do the same thing with g. I'll say that g gets a little bit bigger. And how much bigger will it get? I'll call that dg. Okay, and then I'll fill in this little corner here. Okay, now look, this new thing is also a rectangle. So then there's lots of rectangles on the page now. There's the original blue rectangle. Okay, there's this uh, horizontally oriented rec red rectangle and the vertically oriented uh, green rectangle and the little bitty pink rectangle. Okay, so then what is the size what is the size of this one that I'm pointing to? How big is that? Times dg, right? The size of it is f of x dg. That's its size. Okay, what is the size of the red one? And by size, I mean area. It is df multiplied by how much? g of x. Good. And then finally, what is the size of this corner piece? How much? df dg. Good. Okay. So is everybody, everybody with me? Okay. So then now, I'm going to call this, this uh, amount right, that we changed by, right, the amount that got changed, I'm going to say it like this. So then I can write the following equation, that f of x plus df, right, that's how, much, how tall the, the new rectangle is, multiplied by g of x plus dg. Okay, then I can FOIL this all out. I can FOIL this all out and say that this is f of x and g of x plus f of x dg, uh, yeah, dg, plus what, df times g of x plus df dg. Okay, because there's four terms on the right-hand side because there's four rectangles, right? There's four rectangles, and each one of them has the area. So this, this one is the original area. This is the horizontal area, the vertical area, and the corner area. So is everybody with me? <coughs> everybody with me? Okay, so then now, now if I subtract, if I subtract from this f of x, g of x, and subtract uh, from this one also 
f of x, g of x. Then I get an expression, which I'll just call how much the area was changing is equal to f of x dg plus df g of x df dg like so. Okay, now have a look at these terms that I'm boxing now. Does this look familiar to you? That should look familiar to you. What does that look like? The product rule. It's exactly the product rule. So then the product rule, I won't take it any further, is saying this. If you have a product of functions, that it can be geometrically understood to be the area of a rectangle. And then, if the sides of that rectangle are changing a little bit, then the amount that the area is changing by is, is the sum of this horizontal piece plus the sum of this vertical piece, and we ignore this corner piece because it's so small that it can be ignored. Okay, so that's what the product rule is saying, is it's geometrically related to the area of a rectangle that is changing its dimensions. Okay, so any question about that? Any question? Okay, so at any rate, that explanation feels much better to me than the, <laughs> than the one on the previous page. Okay, so let's do an example of actual computation. So then, how about, please compute for me the derivative of x squared times the sine of x. And since this is the first one, I will do it. Okay, just so I can hopefully establish in you a good habit. So then, I see that I want to compute the derivative of a product, so probably I'm going to use the product rule. Okay, so then x squared derivative sine of x plus x squared sine of x derivative, like so. Okay, so then do I know the derivative of x squared? Sure, it's 2x, okay, and then sine of x and then plus x squared. And do we still remember the derivative of sine of x? Yes, it's cosine of x. Okay, so any question about this example? <coughs> any question about it? Okay, so let's do another one. It's kind of hard to come up with examples right now because we don't have very many functions. Okay, so then how about the derivative of something that we can do. How about, yeah, let's do this example. x squared times x to the fifth. Okay, so then, now don't raise your hands or anything, but who used the product rule? Did you need to use the product rule? No, 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 I hope that you didn't. So then let's do it with the product rule. So then, according to the product rule, this should be x squared derivative times x to the fifth plus x squared squared times x to the fifth derivative. So then this will be 2x times x to the fifth plus x squared times 5x to the 4. Okay, so then after simplification, that will be, what, 2x to the 6 plus 5x to the 6, which is, after adding that together, 7x to the 6. And doesn't 7x to the 6 look like the derivative of something? It does, doesn't it? It's the derivative of what? x to the 7. Ah, and is that obvious now? Should be, right? <laughs> so then now, the, the moral of this story, of this particular example, is this. It can be summarized like this. In your math career, what did you take first? Did you take algebra first, or did you take calculus first? Algebra first. Generally speaking, that is the rule. 
in doing problems is that you perform algebraic steps prior to calculus steps. If you, if you attempt to do them in the other order, it can become chaotic. Okay, so always perform any relevant algebraic simplifications prior to doing any calculus. And so any questions about that example? Okay, so then let's see if I can come up with another example. We have very few functions. Okay, we'll do it like this. How about, uh, yeah, why not? How about, ah, yeah, we'll do it like this. The sine of 2x. Now, I know I'm aware that some of you have taken calculus before and you are aware of something called the chain rule, but I'm telling you it is not legal to use the chain rule. Sorry? No, we're going to learn it next week. But right now, right now, no chain rule. Okay, so then, if I'm telling you you can't use the chain rule, then there must be some other way, <laughs> there must be some other way to proceed, right? Okay, so then someone give me a hint. What is it? Ah, uh, double angle, right? I can use a trig identity. I can say that, well, this is 2 sine of x cosine of x. I didn't now. How do you suppose I can compute the derivative of this product? <laughs> With the product rule. Okay. So then, okay, good. So then I can say that, well, this is 2 uh, multiply, well, I'll do it like this. 2 sine of x prime cosine of x and then plus 2 sine of x cosine of x prime. Like so. So then I can say that this is 2 cosine of x cosine of x plus, no, well yeah, okay, I'll say plus, plus 2 sine of x negative sine of x. Okay, so then now I could simplify this and say that I can see that there's a common factor of 2, so then 2, and then I'll say cosine of x squared minus the sine of x squared. Okay, and that, that right there is a trig identity. What trig identity is that? I might have heard it, what? It, okay, so I, I, heard, I heard something that's wrong, but I was looking for it. Someone said one. <laughs> it's not one. Okay, so then it would be one if I changed this minus to a plus. Then it would be one. But that's not plus, that's minus. Right, so then it's not 1. It's not 1. So then what is cosine x squared minus sine x squared? The cosine of 2x. It is the cosine of 2x. And for those of you that have taken calculus before, you should now see, ah, okay, now I see it. Right, because by the end of next week's lecture, you'll be able to go from here to the end in one step without any of these intervening steps. Okay, none of these intervening steps will be necessary <laughs> because you'll have something called the chain rule. Okay, so any question about this example? Any question about it? Okay, great. So then besides, uh, how can we combine two functions now? We can combine two functions by adding them, subtracting them, and multiplying them. Ah, but there's one more thing that we can do with them. Divide, right? We can compute quotients of functions. So then, here we are. We have the quotient rule. Okay, and here's the quotient rule. The derivative of f of x divided by g of x is equal to this. 
f prime of x g of x minus f of x g prime of x. Okay, so then, it's, so far it looks pretty good, right? Looks pretty good. Looks kind of like the product rule. It looks kind of like the product rule. What's the difference between what I have written right now and the product rule? Right? It has a minus. Okay, but now here's where things get significantly different over g of x squared. Okay, so then if I write this in, in that other notation, right, I could write it like so u over v prime, like this. I want to compute the derivative of the of the quotient here. So it will be u prime v minus u v prime over v squared. <coughs> Wonderful. Okay, so then now uh, I'd like to share something with you and it is this. That uh, in practice, I would say that <laughs> most mathematics, like the mathematics that mathematicians deal with, there is no quotient. <laughs> there is no quotient rule because we don't we don't use it like this. We actually use something else, right? So then this this formula only applies in this class, and so the only time I actually ever use it and need to know it is in this class. Okay, so for that reason, I kind of need a little help to help me memorize it, and so there's a little jingle that goes with it. Right, a little jingle that I sing in my head every time I try and recall it. Okay, so it is this. So if I rename, if I rename these things to H and L, like so, then the formula is this. Okay, and that formula can be read aloud like this. Low d high minus high d low over low squared. Okay, and that's what's, that's what's been going on in my head for the last 90 seconds, okay? <laughs> so, it works fine, okay? So then I personally don't care how you memorize the formula. Okay? I, have no, I have no care in, in my heart whatsoever. I only care that you do memorize the formula. Okay, so I call these things high and low. Right, because of obvious reasons, right? Low d high. What do I mean by d high? The derivative of the high thing. Right. Low d high minus high d low over low squared. Great. Okay. So, any questions about this? Believe it or not, this is pretty much standard. No, there's no way. I mean, this. You can find someone singing it on YouTube. I'm certain of it. Well, I'm going to post this on YouTube. So. There's going to be at least one. But I'll be one among many. Oh, yes, there's all kinds of calculus songs. Like, uh, my son knows how to sing the quadratic formula. He's four. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's do an example. So how about, please compute for me the derivative of something like this. x. No, I, let's do it like this. 5x plus 1 over uh, 4x plus 3. Okay, so how do you suppose we should compute the derivative of this quotient? Right, okay, good. We'll use the quotient. Okay, so then since this is the first one, then I will do it. So 5x plus 1 prime. 4x plus 3 minus 5x plus 1, 4x plus 3 prime divided by 4x plus 3 squared. Now, I'd like to say that it's tempting not to write a line like what I just wrote because you'd sort of like to do as much as, as little work as possible. I'm sure that that's the case because you're a human being. Uh, but don't do that, okay? You don't want to do that for two reasons. One reason is that if you try and do work in the, is that if you try and do work in the air, you'll probably make a mistake. Humans are not actually that good at that task. Second, 
okay? If you do work in the air, then it's not written on the page and the grader can't see what you did and they only have, they, the only thing the grader can assume is that you had no idea what you were doing at all, okay? But if you write a line like this, which is correct, and then you make a mistake, then the grader thinks, ah, well, they just got flustered or whatever. So then, so please write as much as you can. So 5x, 4x plus 3, minus 5x plus 1, times 4, 4x plus 3 squared. Okay, so then that will be 20x, uh, 20x plus 15, minus 20x plus 4, like that? Is that the way it is? Ah, right, minus 4. Y minus 4. Uh, you got to distribute, right? There's some parentheses here, like so. Okay, good. Okay, so then you can see that there's positive 20x and negative 20x. Those things canceled. And then 15 mi minus 4, that's 11. So then 11 over 4x plus 3 squared. So any question about this example? Yes? No, please don't do anything to the bottom part. Okay, so then generally speaking, I'm not interested in you s doing a whole bunch of simplification, just some, and maybe not, not much at all. Okay, so any question about this example? Okay, so let's do one more in the time that remains. Okay, so then how about for example, let's compute the derivative of tangent of x. So what, what trig functions do you know the derivative of? Sine and cosine, as far as this class is concerned. So you don't know the derivative of tangent. So we're going to have to do something here. Ah, right. Tangent can be written as a quotient. So then this is the derivative of sine of x over cosine of x. Ah, so we can use the quotient rule. We can use the quotient rule. So then this is sine of x prime cosine of x minus <coughs> sine of x cosine of x prime over cosine of x squared. Okay, so then the derivative of sine is cosine, so then that would be cosine of x squared. The derivative of cosine is negative sine multiplied by sine. Okay, so that's sine squared, and so that's minus sine squared, so we're subtracting negative sine squared, so then plus sine squared after simplification in the numerator, and then divided by cosine squared. And so now, that is a trig identity, and that is a plus, so what is that? That's a 1, so that's 1 over cosine of x, 1 over cosine of x squared, but we don't write 1 over cosine, typically. We have a name for 1 over cosine. What's its name? Secant. So this is secant of x squared. Okay, so what is the derivative of tangent? It's the secant of x squared. So now, before we go, the last things I need to write down are these. So how many trig functions are there, named ones? Six. There are six. Sine, secant, and tangent. Cosine, cosecant, and cotangent. Right? There are, there are Six, because there are two groups of three, those without co in their name and those with co in their name. So now, let's write down all of the derivatives of, this, of the trig functions. Okay, and I want you to see a pattern. Okay, the derivative of sine is cosine. 
the derivative of secant of x. Now, we didn't do this, but secant is 1 divided by cosine, so you could compute the derivative of secant with the quotient rule of 1 over cosine. You could compute the derivative in that way. Okay, so I'm just going to quote it to you. The derivative is secant of x tangent of x. Okay, now what is the last trig function that doesn't have co in its name? Tangent. Okay, so then this is secant squared. Okay, now I want you to see something that's important because there are six trig functions. You need to know the derivative of all six. But what I'm going to tell you now is actually you only need to memorize the derivatives of these three. Because watch what the pattern is. So I need to move that over just to here. Isn't that great? Oh, I love that. <coughs> okay, so then now, the derivative of sine. Now, what is the, what is the co-function of sine? Cosine. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Okay, now, what is the co-function of secant? Cosecant. So the derivative of cosecant is going to have a negative in front of it. Now, look at, the, look at the derivative of secant. What is the derivative of secant? It's secant tangent. So what is the co-function of secant? Cosecant. And what is the co-function of tangent? Cotangent. So this is negative cosecant cotangent. Okay, now what is the co the cofunction of tangent is cotangent, so the derivative of cotangent is because this is a cofunction, its derivative will have what in front? A negative. And then now I look at the derivative for tangent, I see secant squared. What is the cofunction of secant? Cosecant. So then, let's look at it on the last one. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. You need to memorize that. You also need to memorize that the derivative of all co-functions have a negative in front of them. And the derivative of all the ones without co do not have a negative in front of them. Okay, so then the translation is, is you take, you take the derivative that you know, you put a negative in front of it, and you change and you take the co-function of each one. So the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. Okay, so now you know the derivatives of all six trig functions. See you on Monday. Yes.